As this is a video of me being rejected video. from the yeah. University of Pennsylvania where I applied early decision. If you're like me and you got rejected or deferred from your ED or EA or REA school, you might be wondering, what happened? Why did this happen? And are you really qualified to attend an Ivy League or top 20 institution if you can't even get deferred from your top 20 school? Especially since the admit rate seems to be much higher in the early decision rounds. Well, here in this video, I'm going to be telling you about uh, if EA slash ED really, really actually help students because EA and ED acceptance rates seem very, very high on service level. But if you do a deep dive investigation into the reality of these admit rates, you can see that they aren't as high as people really think. All right. So first of all, let's talk about who really gets in ED, EA, or REA. There's a few groups of people and some of them are really special groups. The first group is people who donated like a lot of money or people who are legacy. Basically people who are kind of buying their way into the university. Next, there are recruited athletes. Most recruited athletes are encouraged to apply early, obviously because the school wants to lock them in, get them to attend the school as an athlete, and most athletes are going to be uh, applying to school early. Uh, finally, there's also children of faculty or people who are on the dean's list. These again are special groups. You'll know if you're in one of these groups. Well, we're going to take a look at the stats in a second, but these three groups are make up a very high proportion of the number of people who are admitted in the early decision rounds, and they also have a higher propensity of actually applying early. Especially, obviously, if you donate 100 million, you're probably going to be applying to that school early. Um, this is obviously an exaggeration as well. It's even if you donate just 2 million, which, okay, when I say just, I know it's still a big number, but even if you donate 2 million, that's still uh, a lot. And to clarify this dean's list here, this basically means people who, for example, have family connection or as well as donors. They're, those are basically people on the on a list made by the dean of admissions who the dean wants to see basically get admitted. And the final group, and this is just like me and you, is higher quality applicants. So this is basically people who are spending more time on their early apps or basically richer applicants who are kind of higher quality. These are the kind of people who are really applying to these uh, IVs and getting an ED, EA, or REA. Um, and you also have richer applicants, obviously, because the thing is, with these kind of early programs, especially ED, you don't get to compare financial aid offers as much. So it's going to be a high proportion of richer applicants, who we also know are overrepresented. If you take a look at our college consulting video at these um, higher, very like prestigious universities. Uh, also, because most people who are applying early, they're applying to their first choice, they're going to be putting a lot more effort into their applications. So this is going to really lead to uh, basically the, the bar for admission kind of being raised and it's going to be harder to get in. So let's take a look at Harvard as a case study. You know, after the Harvard last year, we got so many stats, it's amazing, but let's just take a look. So Harvard had 8,000 EA applicants and 700 EA acceptances they had 2,000 total admits. So we're going to use this to calculate a few things. First of all, we know that 11% of Harvard's admits are athletes. Therefore, around 220 of the EA are athletes. We're going to assume here that basically every single athlete is applying early action. Uh, for Harvard, it's restrictive early action, but I'm still going to refer to it as early action. Um, so basically, we are going to assume here that almost all the athletes are basically applying early because they've been recruited by the university, you know, if they apply, they're almost guaranteed a spot. So they're most likely going to be applying early and they'll probably encourage my Harvard and the guidance counselor as well as that trend to all do that. From there, there's only 480 spots remaining, much lower than the 700 we had before. But that's not all, right? The next thing we can extrapolate data from this. So when I say you can see here over six years, 6,000 LDC students applied. And when I say LDC, that means legacy. So people who had one or more parents or grandparents who basically attended Harvard. You have a D for Dean's List, which are basically people who either have a family connection to the Dean or, you know, they're very powerful people. They're able to talk to the Dean. Um, or for example, people who just donate a lot of money and that's going to get them on the Dean's List as well. And finally, C is for children of faculty. So, you know, if your mom is a professor at Harvard, you know, that's going to put you in the children of faculty and that's going to give you a small bump in the admissions. That means if over six years, 6,000 LDC students applied, there's around 1,000 LDC applicants a year. And we can find this from this chart, basically. So this was from the Harvard Affirmative Action Trial. And you can see 
um, over six years, there were 6,000 LDC applicants, and they had over here a 33% admit rate across these six years. Um, I know you can see here that a non basically LDC or athlete legacy donor or not donor dean's list or child of faculty, your admit rate is much lower. She is athlete, but since we already covered that, it's not really that important anymore. Okay, so at a 33% admit rate, you're getting around 3 out of 30 LDCs every single year. And I know one important thing though before we calculate in to our uh, like full results is that not all LDC applicants apply REA. There's a bunch of things like people just being lazy. They just, they, you know, there's going to apply RD. Um, there's people who maybe, what's it called? They're like their mom's a professor at Yale and their dad's professor at Harvard or something like that. And then from there, they're basically applying to Yale instead of Harvard first. And, you know, that's the same thing for like legacy. Maybe you have legacy at uh, two different Ivy Leagues or two different schools you really want to go to and just choose the other instead of the for, instead of Harvard. So it's not true that all LDCs apply REA. However, we can assume that most are applying to Harvard REA. For Dean's List, which is basically people who have like some connection, there's a specific reason they are on the Dean's List. Um, that might be they donate money, and if you donate a lot of money to Harvard, you're most likely going to be applying to Harvard in the Early Action REA. Uh, same thing for Legacy. Legacy gets considered most in REA, and it's very unlikely that you have people, your parents who, or grandparents who are Legacies at like four, three, two different Ivy Leagues. Most likely, at most, you'll have maybe your dad and mom, they both met at Harvard or something like that. But most LDCs are only LDCs at Harvard. They're not LDCs at any other school, and therefore, they're most likely to apply to Harvard REA, because that's also when this kind of thing gets, um, factored in most. All right. So let's say that 80% of the 330 LDC yearly admits are EA admits. Um, so there, that means that around 260 of the EA admits are LDCs. And there are only 220 spots remaining for the regular people. And now when we basically find out the true acceptances, so we can remove 500 or around that much from this like applicants and then we're we bring down the acceptances to 220 there are only around three percent of regular people admitted to harvard in the rea round just like regular decision and i know this is kind of um it's kind of low it, it's a it might be lower than the actual rate by a few um percentage po not like percentage points like maybe the actual admin rate is 3.6 or 3.7 but what I'm trying to say here is that the actual boost, once you factor in all these special factors like athletes and LDCs, the admit rate isn't as high as they want you to believe. And the EA or REA doesn't actually provide a huge boost for many universities. However, it can still help. And this is something that is true for the university where I unfortunately was rejected from, University of Pennsylvania. So there at UPenn, you have, you see the big difference is there's more EA, and when I say EA here, UPenn has ED, but I'm just going to use the words interchangeably here. So UPenn's uh, ED or EA acceptances are basically 1,200, and this is much higher than Harvard. And now we know for the thing is that athletes are, it's not like UPenn has more sports teams, right? You're still competing in the Ivy League, the exact same like sports division, everything like that you're having a very similar amount of athletes. It, just because you have more uh, students at your school doesn't mean that you have more athletes. The sports team, let's say a swim team for each competition is 10 people, that doesn't mean you have 20 people at the swim team now at UPenn because there's just more students at the school. That doesn't make sense, right? It's still a very similar amount of athletes, and while there might be a few more, it's not going to be super high proportionally. Now, LDCs do get upped a bit, right? Um, but I'm not too sure about deals this, but I know obviously you have more faculty with more students and therefore that will lead to more children of faculty. And same thing for legacy with more graduates every year, you have more uh, people who are going to be applying as legacies. But even if we up this number a bit, we still get 700 spots remaining and you get your uh, ED admit rate for UPenn at 8.75%, which is almost double the RD admit rate of 4.5%. So you can see that for some schools, such as UPenn, there is actually a decent buff for the ED round. And if you are looking to kind of strategically apply 
early to try to, you know, up your chance of getting a school. And you don't really care that much about which school you're going to. You're, you, you just want prestige or something. Try looking for a school like UPenn where there's a clear uh, buff for ED applicants. And the reason this is really true is because schools want to lower their yield rate, which is the amount of people who get admitted but choose not to attend. So they'll basically admit a lot of people in the early decision binding program. Or it also shows like pretty good demonstrated interest if you're applying early because that means, you know, you, this is your first choice school. You're going to go there. You love the school. And obviously schools are looking for people who really want to go. They don't, they're not looking for people who are just like, oh, this seems like a nice school, right? And the, the, the one thing, though, that's important to take away is that this is also showing that you shouldn't really doom so hard about regular decision. All these special applicants, everyone who's a donor, uh, people who are the legacies, all these basically people who have these kind of unfair advantages, they're born into these advantages, they have already been admitted to their schools at this point. Uh, a lot of the best quality applicants as well, they've also already been admitted. Now, the playing ground, the bar to entry, and basically the average applicant quality is lower than it is in the early decision round. So if you're like me and you got rejected or deferred or whatever it is, that does not mean you have no chances. In fact, your chances of getting admitted to a school are even higher now than they were basically in the ED route. All these special groups are gone. And the final thing is that even if 30 to 50% of the class is filled early, the number of admits goes up in RD. So for example, University of Pennsylvania, sure, they, they fill up half their class in ED, and there's only a thousand TR spots remaining, they still admit a lot of people. They still admit a uh, thousand, eight hundred, two thousand people, and that's because of the yield rate. The number of admits is not equal to the number of people who actually go to the school. So even if, for example, I know Harvard, Phil, there's still a thousand, three hundred spots remaining, they're, they're not going to just admit one thousand, three hundred people. They're going to admit maybe two thousand people. They're going to admit a higher amount of people because they know people are going to get admitted and just choose not to attend. So don't doom so hard on RD or ED, uh, RD or whatever it is, um, if you got rejected from your early school or if you got deferred. You still have a very good chance, and all these special groups are mainly gone now. Um, now, this does not really say anything about ED2. I didn't do much research into ED2 because there's not too much public info about that. You know, I get almost everything from this Harvard lawsuit. But ED2 does uh, provide a pretty decent advantage to uh, applicants from what I know. So, you know, if you have a school that's maybe you got rejected from your first choice school in ED, now you're looking for another school like maybe U Chicago, NYU, and you really want to go there, feel free, go ahead in ED2 because it is probably going to provide an advantage because additionally, you know, a lot of the special groups are not applying ED2, they're applying ED1. All right. So what did, what are the key kind of takeaways from this video? Number one, EA and ED and REA added rates are misleading. They are higher than they actually are. And the amount of the, like how bad it really is compared to what, um, like the websites and the schools say depends on the number of students admitted in the EA, REA or ED rounds. A school with a lot of admits for the early programs, you will get an advantage if you are applying early. And that's because of demonstrated interest and stuff like that. But if the number of admits for early programs isn't that high, like Harvard or Yale, that's because they're mainly taking special groups and it doesn't actually provide a big advantage if you do choose to apply early to those schools. The next thing is that even if you did get rejected, you still have a very good chance in the regular decision round. Even if you got deferred, you can still get admitted. So uh, don't lose hope. You know, I know Merry Christmas, everyone. It's the 25th when I'm uploading this. There's a few days left to finish all the apps. Uh, good luck to everyone on that. I'm, I know I'm still running a few of mine, but yeah. All right. Congratulations to everyone who did actually get admitted in their early rounds. You know, you just if you watch the video to the end, <laughs> thank you for watching. Um, like, it's actually a pretty big accomplishment to get early. Don't think that you just got in because of early. Because you can see here that early is not very easy. It's just as hard or sometimes like it's just as hard or maybe just a bit easier than the regular program. So if you did get in early, don't think that you just got in because you applied early. You got in because you deserve to be at the school and you would have likely been admitted to a top tier school if you had applied in regular as well. Huge congrats to all of you guys. And, you know, have fun for the rest of your school year. If you are an athlete, LDC, you know, no, no shame to you, you know. Like, if you're an athlete, I know I literally don't go outside every day. So good job in exercising. And for LDCs, like, 
you know, if you have an advantage, why not use it? Finally, to everyone else, good luck. I know I'm going to need a pretty good amount of luck. Uh, <laughs> Getting this girl, regular decision. Thank you guys all for watching and, you know, Merry Christmas. Bye, guys.